Well, hey there. This is Chris Lay, the podcast operations manager for Lee Enterprises. And for this latest season of Crime Beat Chronicles that you're listening to, we wanted to highlight a series from the Roanoke Times titled Septic that was first reported and produced in 2018 by journalists Jacob Demet and Robbie Korth. A five-year-old child went missing in Dublin, Virginia, the spring of 2015. When his body was discovered days later in the family's septic tank, the mother was put on trial both by the court system as well as social media, where misinformation, accusations, and vengeance-fueled comments spread unchecked. It's a tragic story, to be sure, but reporters Demet and Korth went to tremendous lengths to capture and present a well-rounded and ultimately humane narrative that explores the way a community failed one of their own, while also touching on broader implications like the effects of Facebook, the stigma of drug addiction in rural America, and the distortion of facts. This is the fourth of what will ultimately be seven episodes releasing every week. So firstly, head back to the start of the series if it's your first time here. And secondly, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you get the latest installments as they premiere. And once you're subscribed, you can explore our archives for other true crime stories as told by the journalists who originally reported them. We'll make sure to include links to relevant articles from Roanoke.com in the show notes. So make sure you check those out for even more context and reporting on the story. And finally, if you appreciate what we're doing with this program, we encourage you to invest in local journalism and support the Roanoke Times or whichever newspaper it is that serves your community. It's the work of local reporters that make shows like this and so many others that you likely enjoy possible. So thanks for listening. And here's the fourth episode, Four Days, which was produced in 2018 by Roanoke Times journalist Jacob Demet and Robbie Korth. Ashley White was 31 years old when she was brought into the Pulaski County Courthouse in handcuffs and shackles. But the trial she was about to face would only focus on one sliver of her life. Even reporters didn't know much about her back then, beyond what we learned during the search and subsequent arrest. She was a drug user, she lived in a trailer, and had left her children unattended. I feel like I have a somewhat fuller picture now of the whole Ashley, as Paul put it. But back then, I'll be the first to admit, I had no idea. Jury selection was the first order of business when the trial started in February 2016. Ashley sat silently by her lawyers for days while potential jurors, Ashley's neighbors, were questioned about any biases they may have had on the case. It took two full days to interview 66 people. Many arrived that morning armed with a false narrative, a set of misguided facts that Ashley White murdered her son, possibly by drugging him, put him inside a trash bag, and then into a septic tank. All but two jurors said that they had been following the case in the news. Thirteen said they'd already made up their minds and would not consider the evidence. Seven said they would be unable to remain impartial. Four had personally posted on Facebook about Noah's death. One had even visited the child's grave. By the end, Judge Bradley Finch determined that 60% of those called for jury duty in Piasque County that day would not be able to sit on a jury, which he noted was an extremely large percentage. After all that, Ashley's lawyers asked for a change of venue. Given the level of vitriol on social media and the way so many potential jurors harbored biases, Kelsey Bolger argued Ashley couldn't receive a fair trial in her own community. Judge Bradley Finch agreed and ordered a change of venue. But Fleener, the prosecutor, didn't want to hold the trial out of town. If the court couldn't sit an impartial jury in Pulaski County, he said he would agree to a bench trial, where a judge hears the arguments and delivers the verdict. Ashley's lawyers agreed. Bailiffs called all the jurors, who had spent two days waiting for the case to begin, into the courtroom and told them they would no longer be needed. They groaned and then filed out of the building. The bench trial was ready to begin. From the Roanoke Times Newsroom, this is Septic. I'm Jacob Demet, reporting with Robbie Court. Trials tend to be a mixture of boring procedural wrangling with glimpses of new revelations about the case. As reporters, we kind of sit there waiting to learn details that, up until that point, investigators had been keeping to themselves. But in this case, the most interesting part of the trial was what we learned didn't happen, 
All these rumors that had been soiling for close to a year weren't true. Multiple people told us Noah's found inside a trash bag in the tank. He wasn't. Even the Roanoke Times, our newspaper, reported in the early days that the boy had been slain, which essentially ruled out the possibility of an accident before anything had gone to trial. The paper later issued a correction. People thought Ashley was on illegal drugs, even though we later learned she took a drug test and only tested positive for Suboxone, for which she had a prescription. The most popular rumor was that Noah had been drugged before he went into the tank. We read the autopsy report. There was nothing unusual in his system. This phenomenon was strange and kind of discouraging. There's certainly a lot of things we don't know about what happened to Noah. Things we honestly probably won't ever know. But these are the facts that were presented in court. They're backed up by evidence, and most of them are agreed upon by both sides. Some of this you've already heard. Some we kind of skimmed over the first time, but it's important to nail down these specifics. The trial really set the record straight. There was a lot of information, but here are some of the highlights. Police testified on the first day of the trial that Noah's infant sister, Abby, was sick when Paul Thomas and Ashley White woke up on March 22, 2015. The parents decided to leave the kids home alone while Ashley drove Paul, who didn't have a driver's license, to work. The couple stopped for gas along the way where they were caught on tape. At first, Ashley lied and said that she took the kids along with her for this trip. Later, she came clean, but that lie would come up over and over and over again. When Ashley got home about 20 to 40 minutes later, she says both kids were safe. She then laid in bed with Noah and began watching television. Ashley put on a show Noah didn't like, so he left the bedroom. That's when Ashley says she fell asleep. When she woke up, Noah was gone. There is some dispute about when Ashley took Suboxone that day. She claimed she took the medication right after she woke up to find Noah missing, but before police arrived. That timing is important because an expert witness testified sleepiness is one of the side effects of Suboxone. If Ashley took the pill before laying down to watch television... The prosecution argued that could explain why she fell asleep in the first place. Police arrived that morning and began the search. They found marijuana inside a small wooden box in the family's trailer. They also found a closet in Abby's bedroom that was full of random stuff, including the ashes of Paul's deceased father. There were some flower pots and reflective wall coatings in that closet, which an expert witness testified appeared to be an old marijuana growing operation. None of those plants were alive, so it was not an active grow. Ashley took drug tests both before and after Noah went missing and did not test positive for marijuana. The prosecution also focused quite a bit on how messy the house was. There were cigarette boxes all over the floor, Mountain Dew cans and Suboxone wrappers on the ground. Multiple investigators testified about how badly the place smelled of cigarette smoke. We've seen the pictures, and we can agree the house was a mess. Four days after Noah went missing, investigators drained the family's septic tank. That's when they found his body, along with boots and a little action figure. Amy Tharp, the region's medical examiner, was one of the first to testify, answering question from Ashley's lawyer, Kelsey Bolger. It's hard to listen to, but we think it gives the only real glimpse we have into what Noah's last moments on Earth were like. And there wasn't any actual fluid in his lungs. His lungs were not uh, particularly heavy. Um, I didn't find any, anything that looked like sewage in his airways um, with the naked eye. I, I can't exclude water because when we remove the airways water will just leak out. Uh, but I, I didn't see anything obvious in terms of sewage. Okay. So how were you able to rule his death a drowning without that, that fluid in his lungs? Uh, because I can tell that there was fluid, at least one aspiration of fluid from the septic tank got into his lungs because it was able to carry that foreign material um, that wouldn't otherwise be in his airspace is way out at the edges of the lungs unless he actually inhaled it. Okay, so that could have been maybe a, a quick initial inhale that may result in, I believe you called it a some sort of spasm of the upper trachea? Yes, uh, particularly with um, either very, very hot material or very, very cold. Um, if you inhale that, sometimes it can cause your airway to, to spasm from the shock of it. Um, and it then it would be very difficult for them to get air in, and they may not continue to inhale fluid after that initial first inspiration. For obvious reasons, that septic tank was a major topic of discussion during the trial. When investigators first approached the tank, they said the lid was on, but loose. It was supposed to be bolted down, but it really wasn't. One officer testified it came off with a light kick. Another officer said only one screw was holding the lid in place. They used a metal detector to look for any other screws that might be laying in the grass around the tank, but didn't find any. 
Gary Meadows, the family's landlord, owned the septic tank and testified that Noah's family had lived in the trailer for five years. So he said that he knew Noah well. Oh, Noah's, he, uh, he was just like my own. Uh, if I was out, uh, he, even the first of, when he couldn't even pronounce my last name, he'd call me Meadows. And he'd be out in the yard, he'd holler at me, and he'd come up, and he'd, he'd stay with me and play around. I must have put his chain on his bicycle a hundred times. He uh, just, uh, beyond belief how close he, he was. He, uh, just like, I see more of him than I did my grandchildren. Sounds like you got to know him really well and spent a lot of time with him. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Spent quite a bit of time with Noah, really did. Played ball with him, pitched ball with him, whatever. You, what sort of ball did you throw with him? Oh, he, he was just learning to play basketball. And, okay. Uh, uh, he was real proud of learning to play basketball. And he had a Nerf balls and different type balls that he'd throw around and play and so forth. Meadows testified that the septic tank had been on the property for more than a decade, and he'd done much of the maintenance on it personally. He'd had an issue with it in 2014, so he hired a retired plumber to reroute the septic tank lines at that time. It appears that was the last time someone went into the tank. Here's Meadows answering some questions about the tank from Kelsey Bolger. Mr. Meadows, are you aware that in order to perform a repair on a septic tank, a permit is required? No, ma'am. Not, not of that magnitude. I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be aware of that. Okay. So you're not aware that when you apply for that repair permit, the department... No, I didn't, I didn't apply for it. I'm not aware that I should have applied. Okay. Would it surprise you to hear that when you apply for a repair permit with the Department of Health, they send out an inspector? I'm not sure I know what your question is there. Would, are you asking me if I know that they should have sent an inspector? No, ma'am, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. So you had no idea that these Department of Health inspectors were available to you to make sure everything was safe and up to code? I have no idea about that. I, I, I don't know the inner works of the Department of, of whatever sanitation or whatever that is. Okay. But you own this property, right? Yes. And you own the septic tank? Uh, yes, ma'am. We'll be on the property. Okay. Mr. Meadows, at the time in 2014 when you were doing that work on the septic tanks, you were aware that Miss White had a young child, correct? Yes. Okay. You never called the, the Department of Health during that time you were doing the work on the septic tank? No, ma'am. Would it surprise you to learn that it is a class one misdemeanor to not comply with the Department of Health regulations that are issued for septic tanks? If, if you say so, yes ma'am. It would it probably would surprise me. Okay. Um, since March 22nd of 2015, have you ever been brought to the Sheriff's Office for an interrogation? Interrogation? Yes. No ma'am. Okay. And since March 22nd of 2015, sir, you have not been charged with a crime, correct? No, ma'am. Since March 22nd of 2015, you have not been arrested? No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Those are all the questions I have for you. Thank you. After Gary finished testifying, prosecutors called a handful of other witnesses and then rested. While there are some things we just have to take Ashley's word for, it's pretty clear the investigator's theory of the crime was that Noah wandered outside alone when he wasn't being supervised, stepped on the septic tank lid, fell inside, and drowned. But what about all these other things? The theory that the septic tank was drained after someone tipped off police that they would find Noah inside? The drugs in Noah's system? The drugs Ashley was supposedly taking that day? Where did these things come from? If you follow these rumors back, a lot of people were involved, so this can't be pegged on one person or group. But there was one local reporter who was involved in spreading this false information a little more than most. A journalist who, to be clear, we don't believe intentionally fabricated anything out of thin air but a lot of what he reported was directly contradicted in court. He's a reporter who isn't well-known outside of southwest Virginia, but here, I guess you could call him almost a local celebrity. Live in Christiansburg, Orlando Salinas, WDBJ7. 
On March 27, 2015, Orlando Salinas, who calls himself Orly, reported on the local news that Noah's body was found after police received a hard and credible tip that they should look inside the septic tank. If that had been true, it would indicate someone knew the child was in there. It didn't happen that way. They looked because the FBI suggested they empty the tank before the second search of the home. On April 2nd, Orly ended his coverage by saying Ashley and Paul, quote, have not been charged at all in their son's murder. Notice how he, like the Roanoke Times, took for granted the fact that Noah's death was a murder. There was no talk back then about the possibility of an accident. This is also the time Orly told us he began to have a falling out with his employer. WDBJ said he was let go from the station because of insubordination. Orly says it was because he was pushing too hard on the Noah Thomas case, often citing unofficial sources that other news outlets wouldn't. Either way, Orly was out, and that was huge news. At the time, he was the most recognizable personality in local news. He was colorful and funny. He broke a lot of stories, but at the same time, ruffled a lot of feathers. Orly never followed the traditional rules of journalism. He always used a lot of unnamed sources. He would make errors and never correct them. But he was pretty popular. After he left WDBJ, Orly didn't disappear. He launched a Facebook page where he continued reporting under the banner of More TV Truth. One of his first big stories he followed as a Lone Ranger was a Noah Thomas case. Among his earliest posts, one connected the dots between Ashley White and Tara Muncy, Ashley's high school friend who was murdered. Orly reported Ashley was one of the last people to see Tara before her death. He also said Ashley didn't fully cooperate during that investigation. Quote, had Ashley White been completely truthful about her actions the day Tarrant went missing, might Muncie have been found sooner, maybe even alive, Orly asked on Facebook? That post is especially egregious to me. Here, Orly is dragging up a 15-year-old murder, which Ashley had nothing to do with beyond losing one of her best friends. Instead of expressing sympathy, he used it as ammunition against her. Orly was also the first journalist, at least that we could find, who ran with the theory that Noah was drugged before he went into the tank. He wrote, quote, I'm told it's not uncommon practice whereby adults on a prescribed methadone treatment program will dip their finger into the vial of liquid methadone and wipe that finger inside the mouth of a crying child. Later in the same article, sources with intimate knowledge say the scenario of either Paul Thomas or Ashley White inserting their finger knowingly laced with an uncertain amount of liquid methadone into the mouth of their son Noah is being strongly considered. Now, Orly didn't make this theory up out of thin air. Ashley White testified that investigators told her right before she was arrested that the boy had been poisoned and put in the tank. And just to note for fairness here, besides Ashley's testimony, we have no verification that she was told that lie by investigators. In the days to come, there were more hints toward this. Mike Fleener, the prosecutor for the case, said in April that the toxicology report, which he was still waiting on at the time, was, quote, critical evidence. Obviously, he didn't say the results would show anything. But just the fact that investigators were waiting on it was enough to keep the rumor growing. That's about the time the rumor erupted on Facebook, where many people still believe it's true. Orly didn't create it, but he threw fuel on the fire when he repeated it as a journalist. Quote, maybe parents should give their kids to someone else if they love drugs more, one commenter wrote on his posts. The Orly saga took a turn in 2017 when Orly was arrested and charged with rape and sodomy. A 64-year-old woman told police she invited him over to her home, and then he attacked her. Orly said the two had a consensual affair. Orly was denied bond in that case and spent five months in jail. But the accusations never went to trial. The prosecutor eventually dropped the charges. Orly's lawyer said the evidence showed Orly's accuser continued texting him after the alleged attack, even inviting he and his wife out for pizza. Orly was vindicated and released from jail in December, but it's going to take him much longer to clear his name after being the subject of so many accusations. He said he's writing a book about his time behind bars. We asked Orly to sit down for an interview. Deep down, I thought his experience of being accused of a crime he's adamant never occurred would have changed the way he looks back on his coverage of the Noah Thomas case. I was wrong. Even after the medical examiner testified that Noah died just moments after falling into the tank, Orly brought up another completely new theory. He said sanitation workers told him it's possible Noah was still alive inside the tank when the search began. That's important because it means had police just searched better, they could have saved him. Just to be clear, there's no evidence of this. I think that is the greatest heartache in this entire thing is that it's possible. Now, just because something is possible doesn't mean it's probable. 
But it's possible that if somebody had something said something to someone in time, maybe, maybe they could have found that little boy and found his little hand on that L hook. Maybe he was trying to hang on. When I spoke with my bosses about that fact that had been told to me by the sanitation people clearly about that, they said, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. I said, why not? That's coming from the guy who no, no, we're not going to go there. That's too much. Our interview with Orly was kind of all over the place, but he kept coming back to the notion that as journalists, we have to be willing sometimes to look beyond official means to confirm information. So when I look at our coverage of the Noah Thomas case specifically, I have some regrets for the way we did it. We At one point, we had a headline where we used this term slain, which kind of make, implies that Noah was killed. And that, oh, he was killed. Yeah. I don't know if using the word slain, if I could go back in time. So I hear you. Should right. Looking at your coverage of that case, do you have any regrets or anything you would change? Mm. No, not really. I still think I pursued truth as best as I could. Um, listen, if, if, if a source, and I'm speaking specifically about law enforcement, isn't willing to speak with me because of a story that I did or because of a tactic I used, trust me, that one mouthpiece, that one PIO, he is not the end of the game. There are a lot of other officers who don't like that PIO and who don't like the chief or don't think that the management in that police agency is doing it well. They're willing to talk. Septic is produced by Jacob Demet and me, Robbie Korth. Music comes to us courtesy of Mike Gangloff and Matt Payton. All courtroom audio was obtained from the Pulaski County Circuit Court Clerk's Office after a request to Judge Bradley Finch. This podcast is all about presenting an accurate account of the death of Noah Thomas and his parents' legal saga. All audio has been edited for brevity and clarity. For pictures, original documents, and other extras, visit septicpodcast.com. And feel free to reach out to us at septic at roanoke.com. This is a copyrighted podcast of the Roanoke Times, all rights reserved. Thank you so much for listening. And again, this was the fourth of what will ultimately be seven episodes dropping every week right here in this podcast feed. So subscribe wherever you get your shows to guarantee that you'll get the latest installments as they premiere. And once you're subscribed, feel free to explore our archives for other true crime stories as told by the journalists who originally reported them. You can find links to relevant articles from Roanoke.com in the show notes. And finally, if you appreciate what we're doing with this program, we encourage you to invest in local journalism and support the Roanoke Times or whichever newspaper it is that serves your community. For Lee Enterprises, this is Chris Lay. Thanks again for listening. Make a difference. Relish a great work-life balance. Enjoy generous benefits and competitive pay. Go home each night feeling fulfilled by your work. Work for an employer of choice. Work for Blue Ridge Hospice. We're always looking to hire compassionate RNs, CNAs, or anyone interested in office or thrift shop work. We've been your not-for-profit community hospice since 1981. Visit our website for more information or to apply today at blueridgehospice.org. That's blueridgehospice.org. Blue Ridge Hospice is an equal opportunity employer.